Amen. Can we give a heartier amen than that? Amen. Praise the Lord, champion of love. You know, I have, um, I have been raised in the era when boxing was a famous thing. People don't really follow boxing like they used to. You know, I won't impose on the young people, but I was raised, I was a young man when Muhammad Ali was a very famous name. And then Joe Frazier. And uh, Sonny Liston was a little bit before my time, but I remember that name too. And Mike Tyson came along a little ways down the road. But what I noticed that the champions change from fight to fight. But I got good news for you. Jesus never lost the fight. He always has been and always will be the champion. Can you say amen? amen? And so that's a beautiful song to begin our topic tonight. The champion of love. What could the champion offer you? What could the champion offer you that no one else can offer you? Tonight we're going to talk about that champion. The one who never lost a battle, never will lose a battle. That's why 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, But thanks be to God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to let you know at the very beginning tonight, you don't have to fight anymore. The battle has been won. The only thing you've got to fight, I'll let you know in the meeting. There's something you've got to fight. And you'll find out what it is. You don't have to fight for salvation. Jesus already won that. You don't have to fight for the kingdom to come. He's building that now for every one of us. There's something that every one of us needs to know is available for us tonight. So bow your heads with me as we ask for the Lord's presence to be here with us tonight. Loving Father in heaven, thank you that we could begin tonight recognizing that there's a champion that will never be dethroned. There is no crown that is going to be transferred from his head to another one that will ever take the place of Jesus. And so tonight as we decide on which side we're going to stand, we pray that we could remember that this champion will reign on the throne of the universe and it is our privilege to one day reign with him. Now speak to us this, this night through your Holy Spirit, we ask. In the name of Jesus, our champion. Amen. This is an exciting topic for me because it talks about every one of us. But the reason why it's personal to me is because I know where I was. I know where I am. Even better than where I was and where I am, I know where I'm headed. You could never appreciate where you are until you come to grips with where you were. You could never appreciate who you are becoming until you recognize what you had to do to get there. The battles that you have faced, the decisions that were confronting you every day. I was a young man very briefly raised in a situation where I was abandoned by my mother and dad. I was only three months old. I was left at the home of a babysitter, a Christian babysitter who turned out to be a, a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. And the foundation that carried me as I got older was laid when I was a young boy. I was taken to church. It was in the church where I learned about Jesus, it was in the church where I learned that even though I was too young to understand some of it, you know, the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he won't depart from it. Well, I have to confess, I'm getting older. I won't say I'm old yet. Don't you do that either. But we're getting older. And I recognize that a lot of who I am today was laid at an early stage in my life. Foundations are important. Everything that is built has a foundation. Everything that we're standing on has a foundation. My wife and I had an opportunity today to go down to the, 
to the midway, to the, to the ship, and look at all those boats and just kind of feel proud to be an American again. But I recognize that in this country, we are a melting pot, and our foundation is one that invites everyone to be a part of it. We have traveled all around the world, and no matter how much we complain about America, I would rather be in this country than in any other country around the world. We have some good foundations that we have to hold together. As I was being raised in this home, Mama Haynes would take my sister and I to church every week. When the sun was setting, she would sing to us and talk to us about Jesus. And she died when I was 12 years old, and there was a particular turn that took place in my life. I walked away from the Lord at the early age of 13. Because there was no anchor there, I lost my anchor. There was nobody to take me to church. Matter of fact, there was no one to show up at school to see if I did my homework. There was no one to say, you're doing a good job. The man that was raising me, he lost his hope. When his wife died, he lost his connection. He said, birthday parties, we tried to give him a birthday party. He said, all my birthdays are dead and gone. And so I had to find my way, navigate my way through the streets of New York City. I would still go to church because I knew that's where I'm supposed to be in the building, but I did not have a connection with Christ. I got involved in the disc jockey world, my sister being three years older than I am. That was the John Travolta days. <laughs> All I was doing in New York was just staying alive. <laughs> I went to John Travolta's club. I saw the Saturday Night Fever Club. That was back then with um, Archie Bell and the Drells and Cool and the Gang. And I was involved in, some of you sinners remember those days. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to take you too far back. But um, I, I was a disc jockey when I was about 17 years old in a club that you had to be 25 and above to get into on 48th Street and Broadway, the Seafood Playhouse. I learned how to party. I learned how to mix records. I was scratching records before they even called it scratching. I was rhyming before they even called it rap. I was dancing when the hustle was out. Do the hustle. <laughs> I remember growing up, I was a young man that just had no direction. I was just hanging out. I got involved in pool hustling. I met an old Italian man on 42nd Street and 8th Avenue. Somebody directed me to this old Italian pool shark, and he said, I'll teach you how to play. And he said, the day that you beat me, I'll never play you again. And one day I beat him eventually, many months later, and he said, now you're ready to go make money. Buy yourself a pool stick and put some cash in your pocket. And I'd gamble every day in my lunch hour down in Wall Street area. I was dating my girlfriend at the time, who's my wife, my sweetheart, the love of my life. I would take her to the pool halls. I would gamble after work. I'd take my pool stick and my boom box with me every day. Those were the two things that I had every day. But the Lord still had a plan for my life. He never forgot the foundation he laid for me. I was partying in the World Trade Center one Friday evening on the 44th floor, the old World Trade Center, obviously. And my girlfriend showed up out of the shadows. What are you doing here? It's Friday night. I said, I'll be at church tomorrow. Just get out of here. Leave. Go. Get out of here. I remember that. I remember years later when I told that story, Max. I remember when I told her, get out of here, go leave. I remember one of my speakers started to smoke. I think God said to me, I could burn this down now or later. Well, he was merciful. It didn't, he didn't burn it down, but I had to disconnect some of the things to keep it from burning down in the club. I would come to church, but I'd sit all the way in the back and... <laughs> while the preacher's preaching, I would... <laughs> I, would I, I didn't really care much about church. I was just in the building. In the building. Every attempt I made to try to drink, drag her down, she had a stronger connection. She dragged me back up. And she would bring me to a house. She was only 16. Her brothers couldn't, wouldn't let her date. There were five brothers. You try to date a 16-year-old that has five brothers. That's like going to Iraq without a weapon. 
<laughs> they'd watch her closely. They'd watch me closely. They know that at 16, you can't trust a young man, especially when the girl is also 16. And they'd take me home, make sure that no evening was dark, and I was never left there with their sister. One Friday evening, though, when I was placed with a pivotal decision, I was working at Bank of America at the time, and somebody said, we want you to be a disc jockey in Miami, Florida. We'll pay you $500 a week. All you have to do is make the decision to say yes. For whatever reason, I said, give me to Monday. I'll let you know my decision. I went home that evening, that Friday night, my girlfriend said, come over for family worship. I was afraid to read the Bible. When I read the Bible, I would say, fa 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 God so loved the fa I was afraid I'd read the Bible, I would sweat. I was nervous. I did not like the Bible. The Bible and I didn't have a relationship because I wasn't living for the Lord. But that Friday evening, after family worship was done, seven of them, her oldest brother had his own family. They lived away. About seven of them have worship. Her mother, including, was eight. And they left us alone, and she said, have you ever heard of a book? And she introduced me to a particular book. Some of you may have heard about it, The Great Controversy. And she introduced me to a couple of chapters in there that revolutionized my life. And that Friday evening, the Lord broke through this hard exterior of this young man, and I fell to my knees, and I began to cry. And I said, Lord, forgive me for wasting my life the way I have. Come into my life. That Friday, I went to work with a boombox and a pool stick. That Monday, I went to work with a Bible and the great controversy. At the base of the World Trade Center, I started looking for people to give Bible studies to. I only had two days exposure to a Bible, but I knew one thing. I knew what I had before, and something happened in me. There was a click that was more tenacious than all the joy I had, gambling, party, pool hustling. But the journey was gradual because I was looking for people to give Bible studies to. I didn't know very much, but whatever I knew, I was telling folk. But there was this inside of me, this, the devil never lets go right away. And I still partied every now and then. And I remember one day I said, okay, just one more, just one more, just one more, just one more. And one Sunday afternoon, we had a car accident with a little Honda Accord, a Honda Civic. I think I may have told you about that. It was small enough to put the whole thing in the ambulance. And I thought to myself, if we had died, I would have been lost. That was the end of that road. I went home and got all my albums, got rid of them, gave them to, sold some, gave them away. Looking back, I guess I had connection to how much money I'd spent on them. I had hundreds, hundreds of albums. But looking back, I should have just thrown them out. I spread my sin around and let other people pay for it. And then I went away to college, came back home. Now, too many years later, we got married. 1984, joined the Heritage Singers. It was in that group that my desire for something deeper than music was awakened. And they nicknamed me pastor, spiritual leader. It was never my intention to be a preacher or anything of the sort. But here I am, 32 years later, 36 years in marriage, through every storm that has come, I'm standing here today a different man than who I was when Jesus found me in Brooklyn, New York. Abandoned is the title of my book, Abandoned But Not Alone. We're about to re-release it. Abandoned But Not Alone. I have learned that the toughest thing to do in life is to make the decision between the old life and the new life. But I'm here to let you know tonight that there's no single decision that has transformed my life and my wife's life more than choosing the road to the right, the road to the new life. Every now and then we pause when we're sitting, when we're sitting in business class on Qatar Airlines, when we are 
overlooking the beach in a condo in Coronado, when we are in Indonesia being chauffeured to the ambassador of the United States home, when people are calling us as though we're someone special, and in Christ we all are special, we look at where we were, and we look at where we are, and we say the difference in our lives is simply choosing the sign that says the new life is this way. Somebody said to me not too long ago, and I want to tell you the story for a reason. Somebody said to me not too long ago, they said, if I take all of your life into consideration, you should be in an asylum somewhere. You should be insane. How does a young boy survive all that abandonment, doesn't know his father, does not know his mother. I said, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I didn't know my natural father and mother, but I have a heavenly father that always knew who I was. And when God has a plan for your life, the worst thing you could do is postpone the best decision you can ever make, thinking that somehow on the left road there's a better life. The wise man, even David, you know, Solomon said, vanity, vanity, it's all vanity. David said, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end is the way of death. Tonight I'm going to give you an opportunity to choose the new life. Do you know what? If I sat down and said to the Lord back in 1981, 79, if I said, Lord, what are your plans for my life? And he said, here are the next 37 years. I'd have said, please, don't. If I knew what was going to happen, I'd have been terrified on one end and happy on the other. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm so glad the Lord doesn't show us what's coming. But I want to tell you, the blessings far outweigh all the attacks of the enemy. All the difficulties that I face, the blessings, young folk, the blessings far outweigh and so the music of the world, the life of the world, the pleasures of the world, I've lost my desire for that. Because that new life that the Lord has given to my wife and me, honey, is a life we could never orchestrate for ourselves. And it all narrows down to two simple categories. In this world of thousands of denominations, when it's all said and done, there are only going to be two classes, old and new. And Revelation describes those two classes. Revelation 22, verse 11. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy what? Still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous what? Still. He who is holy, let him be holy what? Still. There's only two categories. Not a single, you can't show me a denomination in that statement. Only two categories. And when you want to find out what category it is, just simply read Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are those that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, the day is coming when the entire world is going to be boiled down, distilled down into only two groups, only two groups, the just and the unjust, the filthy and the righteous. And I want to tell you tonight, I want to be in the just and righteous group. Anybody else? I want to be in that group. Everything that's popular right now will one day evaporate. Beyonce, Jay-Z, Taylor Swift, hip-hop, rock, jazz, it's all going up in flames. There's only one that's going to be fireproof. Somebody once asked me what I do. I said, well, I do, I do a number of things. I sell life insurance and fire insurance. <laughs> and I also sell a retirement plan. <laughs> My retirement plan is out of this world. Come on, somebody. Amen. At the end of this journey, there will be only two seats, smoking and non-smoking. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? Yes. And I ain't going to be in the smoking section. <laughs> and you know what? You don't have to be either. 
But right now, our world is blinded. America, and America has inoculated the, inoculated the world with pleasure that has blinded us. It's become the fabric of our daily thought. We are saturated. We are media saturated. The devil has kept us in the pursuit of, what they say, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And somehow we think that if we could just get a little bit more pleasure and then we'll give our lives to the Lord, what we really don't know is pleasure doesn't really begin until you give your life to the Lord. Oh, yeah. I've been places and done things that I could never afford. And every time something else comes, the Lord always finds a new way to take away our breath. Because he says, I got something else for you. And he unveils it, and we say to each other, wow, is God good? But this is the other side. Let me show you all the contrasts. Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief does not come except to do what? Steal. To do what else? Kill. And to do what else? Destroy. I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it how? More abundantly. I've seen people cleaned up. I've seen drug addicts restored. I've seen folk this close to death brought back by the power of Christ. I've seen miracles performed. I've seen people that the doctors have declared we can do nothing more. They live a year and a half longer. I remember getting a phone call once. I was actually out of town at the time, and my elders got a phone call and one of my elders at the hospital said, your mother's about to die. We can do nothing more for her. In a matter of hours, she's going to be dead. And I said, go and anoint her and pray for her. She lived a year and a half later. The next week, she was in church. Oh, yeah. Only the Lord can turn around something that seems final. But the devil has, has wrapped his stealing, his killing, and destroying in a package that is deceptive. And somehow we think that it's better if we go that route. And the, and the proof is this. When you, when you offer somebody abundant life, somewhere in their psyche, it, it, it almost appears as though they respond like you're offering them Sinai. It amazes me as a pastor when I said, how many of you want abundant life? And people say, no, 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 not that. I've seen it happen. But one day the spell is going to be removed and there'll be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. One day there'll be no more invitations for eternal life. One day there'll be no more calls. As was the days of Noah, the Spirit of God was withdrawn from that world and there was only evil continually. One day there'll be no more opportunity. That's why we have to be satisfied with Jesus and not just satisfied with religion as usual. Because Jesus warned the people of his day, Matthew 7, 21 to 23, he said, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me, this is such a sad text, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Is it possible to prophesy in the name of Jesus? Yes or no? Even without the Lord, you could do it. That's what the text is saying. I've cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name. You can do all those things without the presence of Christ in your life. And then Jesus said, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness or you who work iniquity. You know why he said I never knew you? 1 John 2, verse 3 and 4. 1 John 2, verse 4. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments, the Bible says is a liar, and the truth is not in him. We live in an age of deceptive religion. It's religion, it's lights, camera, action, excitement. But under the hood, there's an engine driving people who refuse to follow the Lord, driving them to their destruction, and it's not God's will. The Isaiah the prophet declared the kind of generation that we would live in. Notice what he said. Speaking about the end times, he said, In that day, and the, the context is the last days, in that day, seven women 
that is seven churches, shall take hold of one man, that man is Christ, saying, look at what they're going to say. We will eat our own food. We will wear our own apparel. Food is the word, the bread of life. Apparel is their own righteousness. But what do they want? Only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. We just want to be called Christian, but we're going to do it our way. Ladies and gentlemen, let me wake you up tonight. We have arrived in the generation that Isaiah the prophet 700 years before Jesus predicted would happen. We have arrived in the generation where the Bible says men will not endure our sound doctrine. We have arrived where religion is designed. People are happy to choose what they want to be and what road they want to travel on. But I want to tell you, if the road that you choose is not the road that Christ has established, you're going in the wrong direction. I don't just want the name. I want the man, Christ Jesus, to be abiding in my life and anybody else. But here we are in a generation where anything and everything is taught, that's the food, and anything and everything is called righteousness, but it's not according to Christ. Jesus continually rebuked the people of his day because he tried to get their attention. He even said to the religious people these words, Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Now let me make a point between Savior and Lord. Do you know what? Jesus is not just the Savior, but he is the Lord. What's the difference? A Savior saves. A Lord, like landlord, wants to be in charge of your life. And not a lot of people want Jesus to be in charge of their lives. It's something altogether different when somebody's in the driver's seat. But the only reason why you may not want Jesus to be in, Jesus to be in charge of your life is because the life he's offering is not the life you want. And I know what I'm talking about. I had that battle. I had that battle. Which life do I want? The life that we have trained ourselves to want is not the life Jesus wants. But when we call him Lord, he says it's not, you can't just call me Lord, Lord, unless you do the things I say. And look at those fishermen, Peter, James, John. Look at all the Pharisees. Look at the publican, Matthew, who gave his life to Jesus. This converted tax collector, Nicodemus. Do you know that one that came to Jesus by night? The one to which he said, uh, for God so loved the world. He said that to a converted tax collector, a Pharisee named Nicodemus. Not a tax collector, a Pharisee named Nicodemus. He said that to him. He said, you're not where you need to be. For God so loved the world. He said it to one man. And when Nicodemus was converted, Nicodemus, read the history, Nicodemus became one of the single responsible individuals for financing evangelism in the New Testament church because he made a choice to come to Jesus by night. But the Lord was trying to make available to the New Testament church his Holy Spirit. And he said, if you make yourself available to the Holy Spirit, something's going to happen. Look what he said. However, John 16, 13, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. I've learned so much through the years, and I'm still learning, because the Holy Spirit never stops leading. He's not going to stop leading and guiding until he guides us into how much truth? How much? All. And there's always more to learn. That's why the Word of God is so significant. Sanctify them by your truth. Your Word is truth. The problem with the people of Jesus' day, which is the same case to us today, the problem with our world today, is the Bible is seen as optional equipment. It's seen as optional equipment. I had a young man come to my church one, one Wednesday evening after we had Bible studies at our church, and people stood up to have prayer, and he stood up too, and I said, wow, I never have seen you before. What's your name? He said, my name is Harmon Davis. This is my wife, Helen Davis two Caucasian couples. I pastor a Caucasian church in the Midwest where less than 20 years ago used to be the Ku Klux Klan headquarters. Does God have a sense of humor? You'll get that tomorrow. 
He puts me to pastor a church in a community that about 20 years ago was one of the Ku Klux Klan headquarters. So this southern man, tall, stately gentleman, I said, are you visiting 3AB? And he said, no. I said, are you an elder at one of our churches? No. I said, are you a deacon at one of our churches? He said, no. I said, are you a member of one of our churches? He said, no. I said, and what brings you here? He said, well, I was watching you on television a couple months ago, and you challenged me to, you challenged me to look up something, and I did it, and that's why I'm here. I said, what was it? He said, well, when you were talking about the Sabbath, you said to me at the end of the broadcast, look up these five words, and whatever you find, take it to your pastor and ask him questions. Saturday, Sunday, seventh day, first day, and Sabbath. He said, look them up. I said, look them up, and whatever you find, take it to your pastor and ask him, why don't you teach the Bible Sabbath? He said, I did that. That's why I'm here. I said, well, tell me the rest of the story. He said, well, I, 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 I found these things. I looked them up and found the evidences that the Bible Sabbath is true, and I took it to my pastor, and I said, pastor, how come we don't honor the Bible Sabbath? And the pastor said, what are you talking about? So well, here it is. It's in the Bible. It's in history. How come we don't honor the Bible Sabbath? And he was the head elder of his church. The pastor took him out of his head, head elder position. His wife was the head treasurer, removed her from being head treasurer. He said, I'm the, this is, a, I'm quoting. He said, the pastor told him, I'm the pastor. You're the member. I speak. You listen. He said, that's not good enough for me. So they took their fifth wheel and went down to Alabama for two weeks and prayed and asked the Lord for guidance. They came back. They came back. A few months later, went back to that church and gave the pastor one more chance. He said, Pastor, how come we don't honor the Bible Sabbath? And he was in the pastor's office when he asked the question, and the pastor's Bible was on the table, wide open like that, and he glanced over and he saw the pastor's Bible highlighted, all through the Bible highlighted, and he said, Pastor, I notice you really study your Bible very well. He said, what are you talking about? He said, all these yellow highlights, all these yellow highlights, he, and he was proud of his pastor. He said, oh, the yellow highlights in my Bible. He said, well, well the things that are highlighted were highlighted when I was in Bible college. Those things that are highlighted are what they told me never to talk about when I was in Bible college. You heard me correctly. I said the same thing. What? So he said, Pastor, so what about the Sabbath? And he said, his pastor said, you got the problem, you solve it. He said, I am, I'm leaving. And at 78 years old, that man came to our church and stood up, and I was shocked. He said, how old? This is Wednesday night at the end of the Bible. He said, how old is too old to be baptized? I said, as long as you're breathing, you can be. <laughs> and he and his wife got baptized about a month later. Their son and daughter, their son and daughter-in-law said they both lost their mind. They said, Dad, you raised us in this Church, all our lives, you left us, you lost your mind. What's wrong with you? Four months later, they got baptized. <laughs> the father recently, about a few years ago, he passed away. The wife is still in church. The son who said his dad lost his mind, he's in church, and his wife is in church. Why? Why? Because they got sanctified by studying God's word. You see, the problem is when people don't want to see the truth. Jesus said that to the leaders of his day in John 9, 39. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world that those who do not see may see. And those that may see and those who see may be made blind. So there are people that said, I see it, and they don't really see it. And there's some people say, I don't see it. And the Lord says, I can show it to you. And that's the generation in which we live in. Look at how Jesus dealt with those leaders. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? Well, were they blind? Yes, they were. They ended up crucifying Jesus. How could somebody who says they are religious become the arm by which Jesus is crucified? They were blind. And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have 
you would have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. You know, here's the danger that we have to, this is the danger. What Jesus addressed to them is what happens to many of us today. There's some people that say, as I've had many instances, I've had so many experiences giving Bible studies through the years, I could spend two more hours just telling you those experiences, but I won't do that. I just, <laughs> Lord, I got to use my time wisely, so I'm not going to tell too many stories. One just came to my mind, but I'll, okay, okay, since you asked, <laughs> since you asked, stop begging, but since you asked, one Sunday morning I was going to play basketball, and I had on my top and my shorts, we were dating at the time, I had on my black shorts, my top, and some people came and rang the doorbell, they were religious, they were going from door to door, and um, they came to my house, and I had my basketball, my sneakers on, and my sweat, my uh, towel over my shoulder. I was on the way to the park to play ball in Brooklyn, New York. I didn't look religious. I looked like a guy just wanted to play basketball. But what they did not know is I knew my Bible. So the guy came to the door, and he, he said he had two young ladies he was going to train to do Bible studies. He was training them how to do Bible studies, and I was going to be the example. <laughs> what he didn't know was this was going to turn sour real fast. So he started attacking me on certain Bible topics. And uh, I didn't have a Bible, so I said, can I borrow your Bible? Let me borrow your Bible. What does that say? What does that say? Max, you remember when I came to the group, I was like a wrecking ball? What does that say? What does that say? He went to walk away. I said, no, I'm not done. What does that say? <laughs> the two young ladies walked away from him and left him there. <laughs> because he said he saw it. But when I opened the Word of God, he saw it, but he didn't want to see it. That's why today, in order to follow Jesus, the one thing that he wants from all of us is this. Say it with me. We have to be what? Willing, willing to be what? Willing. Got to be willing to be willing. Not just willing, but you got to be willing to be willing. And why? Look at the blessing that comes with being willing to be willing. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 12, for if there is first a willing mind, it is what? Accepted. You could be at the lowest part of the totem pole. You could, be, you, you could be the person that doesn't understand hardly anything. But if your mind is willing, the Bible says you're accepted. The Lord accepts people that are willing. He doesn't say you have to know everything. He says if you're willing, you're accepted. Accepted what? According to what one has. And not according to what he does not have. Some people think you got to know everything before you give your life to the Lord. Said, the Lord said, no, I'm just looking for somebody that's willing. He found fishermen that didn't know, they didn't even know how to catch fish. <laughs> All night, the Lord said, Could, if you go to the other side of the boat, there's more fish over there. And when they cast their net at his command, you know the story, the net was breaking. They couldn't even pull it in. But you know why they got the fish? Because they were willing. They thought they knew it, but he said, uh, guys, the other side of the boat. Now watch this. How far is that? The question I ask is, why were those fish not over here? You know why they were not over there? Because Jesus said to them, go over there. <laughs> and the Lord wanted to see if they were willing to be willing. You know what? When you are willing to be willing, can I tell you something? When you are willing to be willing, the Lord will fill your nets. But we often want our nets filled before we are willing. It doesn't work that way. He says, when you, when you are willing, I will accept you where you are. I won't ask you for more than you have. I'll accept you just as you are. So you have to be willing to be willing, right? That's the first thing. Secondly, you have to be willing to do what? Follow Jesus. That's what these fishermen did. You have to be willing to follow Jesus. Let me tell you something. Nobody has a better journey than the journey that Jesus has. I mean, who do you know? Who do you know that who has a backyard that has billions of galaxies in it? Who do you know that can wake up in the midst of the storm and say to the winds, would you stop making noise? And they say, sorry, Lord. He can say to the waves, peace be still. My bad. 
And he said to the storm, shut up. All right, we got it. Didn't mean to interrupt. Who do you know that can call the stars by name? Who do you know that can say to the ocean, go no farther? Who do you know? Who do you know? As the two little boys that were having a conversation, one little boy was saying to the other one, the one rich kid was bragging his brains out to the poor kid, and the poor kid didn't know what to say. He said, see that yacht? See that, see that mansion on the hill? That's my dad's mansion. And the poor kid, see that yacht on that ocean? That's my dad's yacht. The kid probably lived in Coronado. <laughs> Some lot of yachts over there. Then he said, see that plane that just flew by? That's my dad's plane. And that kid said, man, that's three strikes, I'm out. I don't know what to say. Then a light came on. He said to that rich kid, you see that mansion on that hill? That hill belongs to my dad. <laughs> Amen, somebody? He said, you see that yacht that's floating in the ocean? My dad owns the ocean. And he said, you see that plane that just flew by in the sky? My dad owns the sky. <laughs> Amen, somebody? Amen. But one of the reasons why we don't give our life to Jesus is because to many of us, that's an intellectual fact. That's not a spiritual reality. I have, the transition in our lives had become from intellectual fact. The Bible is a fact. You can't change it. But if you go from intellectual stimulation to spiritual transformation, you'll understand that surely the ocean does belong to your dad. And literally with Jesus, skies, you ever heard the phrase, sky's the limit? With Jesus, he doesn't stop with the skies. He keeps going and going. That's why he said to these fishermen that was smart enough, then he said to them, Matthew 4, verse 19 and 20. Then he said to them, follow me. Those are two powerful words. Say it together. Follow me, and I will make you. Wait, you, you guys always think about food. <laughs> follow me, and I'll do what? I'll make you. You cannot be made without following Jesus. He's the surgeon. He's the guy that molds us. Follow me, and I'll make you. And the Bible says, they're still whispering, fishers of men. Forget about the fish. The Bible says, then immediately, they immediately, what did they do? Immediately left their nets and followed him. And you know what? You don't remember the names of the Pharisees and all the religious leaders. Pilate's name has been stricken from history except in the Bible. But you remember Peter, James, John, Thomas, Bartholomew, all those guys that followed Jesus. They went from shameless the famous in Christ. And they allow the Lord to be the glory of their lives. That's why Jesus said through the Apostle Paul, who knows pra practically better than anybody else, he says, therefore, if anyone, if who? Anyone. Doesn't matter where you're, your color, your race, your class, your educational level. If anyone is in Christ, young folk, old folk, you could be 95 or 9. If anyone is in Christ, what happens to him? He is a what? New creation. I know it. I know it. When I go back to Brooklyn, I ask for certain of my friends. They don't live anymore. I was that close to being on that road, held up at gunpoint. One Friday night, one Thursday night, my, my wife's brother dropped me off on my way home and I'm at a gunpoint. Two guys, three guys held me up at gunpoint. Why did the Lord prevent that from being the end of my life? Because he, he had a schedule for me to be here in Coronado 40 years later to tell you about the God who saved me. A new creation. What happened? All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become what, my friends? And you will never know how new they could be until you put your life in the Lord's hands. Oh, yes, he could do things that you'll never imagine, but you'll never know. You see, it's like this. Check this out. This is the swimming pool. What is this? Okay, this is the land. 
It's 102 degrees. Here are some people. They're just like this. They're sweating to death. They have on their swimming suit, and they're wondering why, why they're still sweating. And all they do is just walk around the pool. Man, it's hot. I'm sweating and focus in the pool, happy and joyful. And somebody is saying, if you just jump in, if you just, if you just jump in, you'll find that all the stuff that's stressing you out and making you sweat will come to an immediate end if you just dive into Jesus. Let me make something clear. If you can't trust Jesus, Thank you. I got a witness. If you can't trust Jesus, oh, I'm trying my best to stay away from politics. Lord, please keep my mouth shut. If you cannot trust Jesus, who can you trust? That's why as corrupt as our country is, read the dollar bill. In God we trust. You got to be willing to follow Jesus. Not only that, together, willing to surrender. Christians don't win by fighting. Christians will by, win by surrender. They win by surrender. You know, when you stop fighting, you start winning. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57, the Bible says, But thanks be to God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what, Pastor Pastor Gabriel, you know what? I don't have to fight. Jesus already knocked the snot out of Satan. I had to say it like a New Yorker. He hit him with an uppercut that left him bleeding. He beat the tar out of him, took the trophy, wore it, and said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And the devil and all of his imps said, we lost the second round. There's only one more round. I wasn't there when he said it is finished in the garden. I wasn't there when he said it is finished at the cross. But I plan on being there when he said it is finished at the end of time. Come on, somebody else. But you got to be willing to surrender. Look at what Jesus said. Look at this. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him do what? Deny himself. And do what else? Take up his cross. And do what? Follow me. What happens when you follow Jesus? Look what happens. John 8, 36. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be what? Free indeed. You shall be free indeed. Not just partially free, but free. Your chains are broken and you're no longer in prison, as you found out a few days ago in the sermon, breaking the chains. He doesn't just break your chains. He brings you out. Praise the Lord for that. Not only that, you have to be also willing to do what? Got to be willing to follow the truth. It's so significant. Here's the reason why. 1 John 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have what? Fellowship with one another. Not friendship. Friendship is shallow. Fellowship is deep. Because friendship is conditional. Fellowship is held together by Christ. It's the Greek word koinonia. We not only have fellowship, but the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from how much? All sin. I, I want to know that when the judgment comes, all my sins are cleansed. I don't want anybody in heaven reading what I used to do. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? As Oswald Chambers once said, one of my favorite devotional writers, Oswald Chambers said it, he said, when somebody says something bad about you, don't get mad because they don't really know how bad you really are. <laughs> and that's the truth. Not only be willing to walk on the light, but we have to also be willing to do what else? You got to be willing to trust God. If you can't trust God, who can you trust? Where's my, where's my person? Right up there. There you go. Testify. If you cannot trust God, who can you trust? What happens when you trust God? Look at the wise man that finally wised up. He said, trust in the Lord with how much? All your heart. And lean not on your what? Own understanding in all your ways. Do what? Acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Now, I know what that means because we live in a world that is manipulative. When my wife and I, we like to go to Best Buy. We live in the Midwest. 
Outside of Best Buy, the biggest store is Walmart. Walmart is our mall. We live in a town with one stop sign, no stoplights, and we have one gas station. When we go to Best Buy, those salesmen are trained to sell you stuff, right? You can't walk up to anything without them giving you a pitch, hey. And they always say, today's the last day. <laughs> Isn't that right? It's always the last day. Well, there's only one left in stock. And I think, here's, here's the secret to, to disarming every salesperson. Because they make it sweet. We always say to them, they said, we could get one for you right now. We'll have it up front. You have a Best Buy card? I have a Best Buy card. But this always disarms them. We always say to them, we always like to pray about whatever decision we make. They, will not, they have not been trained to respond to that. And then we say, if God wants it for us, it'll be here when we get back. And they go, all right. Because, <laughs> you know, the world works emotionally. What they could get you emotionally connected to, they'll sell to you. I'm only emotionally connected to Jesus and my wife. Everybody else, I'm going to pray about you. Not only willing to trust God, but now let me open the door to the biggest part as I begin to wind up tonight. You have to be willing to be what? Baptized. So many people don't know what this is. It's the door to the most prosperous future you'll ever, 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 ever know. When we got baptized at 19, my wife and I, we were not married yet. We got married at 25. But when we got baptized, her brother said, I don't know why they got baptized together. Do they plan on getting married? Well, at the time I wasn't until her brother proposed. <laughs> you know the story. But our lives took off. After we got baptized, our lives were revolutionized. And that's why the Lord says it this way in Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Oh, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into what? His death. When we are baptized, it's not just joining the church. It's first and foremost, you are going into a grave. The water represents a grave. You are going into the same grave that Jesus went into. He went into the, he went into the Jordan before us. So when you go into the water, you're going in with him. The, the nature that you had, he already took it into the water. When you go in there, you're taking that same nature. When you're placed under that, that nature is being put to death. And when you come out, you don't come out the same way you went in. That's why he says it this way. Romans 6 verse 4. Therefore, we were buried with him through what? <laughs> Baptism into death. That old man Adam died. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in what? Newness of life. Oh, well, man, I should just do one sermon on telling you how many times God has found stuff for us that we left on planes, in the malls, in airports. But I just didn't have enough, I didn't have enough days. I wanted to tell you how he works. All right, since you ask. <laughs> I was on my way to Australia, both of us together. We went to the San Francisco airport. I have my laptop. You know, they put everything through that. They put that on the conveyor belt. Security, got on the plane, got to San Francisco, got to the hotel. I mean, in Australia, got to the hotel a day later, because they're a day ahead of us. Got to the hotel, picked up my bag to go up the steps. I said, well, my bag is light. I opened it. I said, honey, did you have my laptop? I don't have your laptop. I left it on the conveyor belt in the San Francisco airport. I'm in Sydney, Australia, Sydney. Sydney, Australia. What time is it in San Francisco? It's 2 o'clock yesterday. <laughs> that, that bug you out. You know, you leave, you, you, you end up to tomorrow, and when you fly back, you end up to today. So they said, okay, call the airport when it opens. So I called the airport. I waited four hours, called the airport. And they said, sir, you left your, you left your laptop on the conveyor belt. People don't find laptops. It's gone. 
I said, but there's a chance that somebody found it. He said, call back in a few hours. If anybody found it, here's the phone number you call back. So I called back, and uh, they said, how can we help you? I said, I lost my laptop. Where was it last? On the conveyor belt in the airport. Sir, people lose laptops every day. Some of them get returned. Do you know what your laptop looks like? Well, it's a, it's a Dell Pentium. It's a P60. It's um, gray and kind of greenish. Uh, do you know the password? Here's the password. <laughs> Always do this. As soon as the password was activated, there was my face right on the front screen. <laughs> they said, uh, is your name John Lomacang? Yeah. They said, we have it. You have my laptop? We have your laptop. Okay, could you, could you Federal Express it to me? They said, sir, we don't, we don't, we don't Federal Express anything. You got to come and get it. I said, I have a seminar tomorrow at noon. How's that going to happen? They said, sir, you got to get, you got to, you got to come and get it. We don't send anything anywhere. Oh, man. Is anybody not here yet that's supposed to be here for the seminar? So I found out a pastor who lived in San Jose was on his way to California. I said, so what airport does he fly out of? They said, oh, he flies out of SFO. San Francisco. I called him. I said, hey, Brother Ivor, how are you doing? He said, I'm doing fine. I said, where are you? I'm on, six, I'm on 680 going north. Where are you headed to? To the airport. Oh, check this out. There's this place at the airport. It has my laptop. Here's the number. Here's what you tell them. Here's the serial number. Here's the claim number. Go get it for me. All right? All right, I got it. Cool. The next day, I got my laptop two and a half hours before my seminar began. Right. Now watch this, watch this, watch this. You will never guess the name, you'll never guess the name of the company that had it. I'm just fluttering just thinking about it. The name of the company that had my laptop was called Covenant Security. If this was my mic, I'd drop it. <laughs> when you make a covenant with God, you got security. Amen. Can I testify? I should tell you about what happened in Nashville and what happened in Miami and what happened on the plane on our way to someplace in the Bahamas and what happened when I left my laptop on the curb in St. Louis, Missouri. Late at night, my whole bag, laptop, bag, iPod, wallet, hard drive, Got to the hotel, and the, I said to the bus driver, do you have my laptop bag? No. You mean I left it outside the airport at the St. Louis airport? He said, brother, this is St. Louis. It's gone. <laughs> I said, could you just get me back to the airport? He said, brother, it's gone. We went on the curb. It's gone. I said, just drive this bus. <laughs> we got to the airport. He leaning that airport bus. We pulled up to the curb. People getting in and out of their cars. Pastor Miguel, people are getting in and out of their cars. There is my bright silver laptop bag on the curb like nobody saw it. I got out, picked it up, and you know what he said? He said, you must know somebody. <laughs> I know somebody. I know somebody. Could you give me grace tonight? I got to tell you about Jesus. Can you give me grace tonight? I got to tell you about Jesus. We were in Miami, Florida, at the Miami International Airport. I just bought my lovely wife a brand new leather bag with a brand new Mac laptop and an iPad. You know, in ladies' bags, if they lose it, their lives are over. <laughs> Wallet, phone, sunglasses, everything that they ever had since they were two. <laughs> so I see Angie jumping up and down like this. I'm thinking, she must be happy to be in Miami. But her face told a different story. I said, honey, what's wrong? She said, tell me you have my bag. I said, I don't have it, but I'll find it. <laughs> I dropped my suitcases, ran across the curb, ran down the street, across three lanes of highway, got to the airport. I'm perspiring. I see a police officer standing like this. 
break a one nine, break a one nine. <laughs> He's standing over her laptop bag. I run up to the guy. I am perspiring like I'm running from immigration. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> my wife's lap. He said, sir, here. In other words, nobody's going to go through all that. And I got 19 or 20 more stories to tell you <laughs> about stuff we lost that God just won't let us lose it. Let me tell you something. When you step into the new life, you got somebody walking with you. He said, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I will cause you to ride on the high places of the earth. You got somebody that's a covenant that's secure. That's why Jesus said it this way through Paul. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, what's the next word? Certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his res resurrection. But Jesus said, you got to be born again. What's the blessing? Jesus answered and said to them, John 3, 3, to Nicodemus, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot what? He cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus, with his highly educated self, said, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time in his mother's womb and be born? He said, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. When you're not born again, you can't see and you can't enter. So, until you're born again, you can't see. You can't see. Some people say, I don't see that. You, you know why you can't see it? Because you ain't born again. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. You don't have spiritual eyes until you're born again. Did you hear what I said? So if you're trying to figure it out before you're born again, you ain't going to see it. Unless one is born again, you cannot see. And if you're not born again, you cannot enter. You could knock, 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 but you can't go in. So don't try to see it unless you're born again. Because you can't. That's why the Lord says, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. You see, my brothers and sisters, the new life brings power. What does it bring together? It brings what? Power. John 1.12. But as many as received him to them, he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. You get power. What do you get? Power. People respect you. Not because of who you are, but because of who you're connected with. That's why Jesus said, but you shall receive power, Acts 1.8. You will receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And then all of a sudden your life is now a testament to his presence. And you will be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You get power when we travel around the world. I'm amazed. My wife and I pause every now and then and we whisper to each other, we're just two knuckleheads from Brooklyn. But when the Lord puts you in places, all of a sudden, he turns on a power that gives you a respect that you never can muster up in your own energy. Amen? Amen. But not only that, you don't just get power. You, the new life brings mercy. Anybody need mercy? Oh, I need mercy. David the psalmist says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Amen, somebody? I have so much more, but I got to ask you the question. I got to ask you the question. Pastor, did you pass out the papers tonight? Pastor Chris, do you all have a piece of paper in your hand? I got to ask you the question. I had one. Can you pass me one, Pastor Lopez? Can you give me one? I'm telling you about something that I want you to enjoy. I'm telling you about something that I want you to enjoy. Was the topic clear? Check yes if it was. Was it clear? Was it clear? Yes. And I want to add part two for tomorrow morning. There's a second portion to this that's going to be included in my message tomorrow. But I believe that you understand 
that this new life is just waiting for the person who wants to take the keys. Do you want to learn more so that you can follow God's truth? If the answer is yes, check yes. If the answer is no, if you think your eyes are better without Christ, please, may, not, may that not be the case. If you want to learn more so that you can follow God's truth, check the yes box. This is true about my wife and me because I was baptized as a, as a, for the second time as a young man when I was 19. First time I got baptized, I didn't even have a connection. Do you want to rededicate your life through rebaptism? Check yes or no. Why is that important? Some of you are getting a fresh look at something that you forgot. But there's no life without Christ. There's no hope without Christ. There's no blessing without Christ. There's no joy without Christ. And you're saying, I want to step into that blessing. I want to step into that new life. I want to know that the death of Jesus was not just something that happened arbitrarily, but it happened so that I could be set free. If you want to rededicate your life because you've seen what you missed, please check that third box. Yes. But there may be somebody who said, I don't know what that blessing is like. I never heard about it. I don't understand what it is. But I want to be able to see. I want to be able to enter. I want my life cleansed. I want mercy. I want a new life. I want a new beginning. If that's you, check yes for number four. Do you want to give your life to Christ through baptism? Let me tell you what that means. That means our pastoral staff will visit with you. They will share with you what the Lord has in store for your life. They'll give you a glimpse of God's retirement plan that one day will be out of this world. You'll understand God's word clearly. In God's word is a treasure of knowledge, not just to inform you, but to transform you. You'll find a love relationship with Christ you've never had before. You'll understand the answer to the question, why did Jesus die? Why did he die? He made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us. Why did he die? That we might become the righteousness of God in him. He wants us to be righteous, but we cannot do it on our own. We cannot do it on our own. We cannot do it on our own. Don't even make an attempt. We cannot do it on our own. So what are the steps to this new life? Please fill that out as I wind up. And then, our, then we're going to sing tonight a song that I believe you'll be able to appreciate one day. What's the steps to the new life? Repent. Genuine sorrow for sin and a turning away from it. That's what repentance is. So many people don't know what it means to repent. Some people want to just join a church but not even repent of anything. They join, they come in as dry sinners, get, become a wet sinner, they dry off and stay the same. Don't sing just as I am and, say, and stay just as you were. We have to repent. I know there are things in my own life I had to get rid of to make room for Christ to come in. Repentance is a beautiful thing. What's the blessing in repentance? Acts 3.19, repent therefore and be what? Converted. Converted, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. When you repent, something happens. Peter said, who knows well, repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and what will happen? You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not only repentance, but also say that together. What's the next one? Believe. Accept Jesus both as Savior and Lord of your life. I don't just want somebody to save me. I want somebody to transform me. What's the blessing of having this faith to believe in him? Here's how Paul writes it in Hebrews 11. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must, what's the next word? Believe that he is. I know he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who do what? Diligently seek him. When you seek the Lord, he will find you. When you seek him, you'll find him and you'll see that nothing can stop a life that finds by faith and belief Jesus Christ. Finally, you have to follow his word. You have to follow his word. The word of God is powerful, but we got to follow God's word. That's why the Bible says in, in Matthew Matthew 28, 20, teaching them to observe how many things? All things that I command them. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I want Jesus to be with me to the end of the age. Anybody else? Yes. And finally, what is baptism all about? Leave the old life behind and accept 
Christ's righteousness. What's the blessing there? He who believes and is baptized will be what? Saved. Anybody want to be saved in here tonight? Can you say amen if you would? He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But here's the sad reality. He who does not believe will be condemned. There's no reason to hear this message and be left out of the kingdom of God. He tells us, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. That's why I travel the world. I want you to be a disciple like I am. I don't want to be a member alone. I want to be a disciple. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I want to let people know you can trust the one that I follow because I have trusted him with my life. And the greatest blessing is this as I end. He who has died together has been free from sin. Anybody want to be free? Let me tell you something, friends. One day, there's going to be a sea of glass. There's going to be a sea of glass. And Jesus is going to be there. And from Adam to the last person that has ever accepted Christ, Every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every people are going to be gathered at that concert, the sea of glass. We're going to see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Noah and Paul and John and Matthew and Timothy. We're going to see the redeemed of the ages. I want to be there. What about you? And the Lord is going to call us by name. Come and get your crown. Come and get your Rome. Come and get your mansion. And then when all the fallen worlds look around to find out who are these people, the Lord is going to say, these are they who have come out of great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Tonight, my brothers and sisters, if it is your pulsating desire to wash away your past and give your future to Christ, I would like you to fill those papers in. And tonight as you leave, give them to the pastor. But as we sing this song tonight and you determine that you want to be by faith in that redeemed host, as we're singing, if the Spirit of God is saying to you, this is your moment, this is your hour, as you're singing and you want to give your life completely unreservedly to Christ, I just want you to stand where you are. And when you stand, you're saying, that's the Christ I want to follow. That's the Lord that I want to trust. That's the one I'm dedicating my tomorrow to. Tonight, one day, the entire universe will look at you and say, these are they that came out of great tribulation. Praise the Lord, somebody. They sing about the future, but you have to make a decision in the present. To be on that sea when that song resonates through the ceaseless ages of eternity. Tonight, I'm going to make a general appeal because I know you filled out those sheets of paper. But tonight, if there's somebody just wants to stand and say, I want to be on that sea. I want to be in that number. I want to hear my name called. I want to hear Jesus say, welcome. I've been longing for this day when nothing separates me from you. Sin and sinners will be no more. The controversy would have ended. Throughout the limitless realms of eternal space, there's one harmonious whole. The battle over sin has ended. And the struggle is over. The table will be spread. And your name tags will be there. Tim, Val, Angie, Max, come on, sit down. And Jesus is going to stand. And he's going to say, welcome home, children. This is the battle that I fought for you. 
And then our journey is going to begin from one world to the next. And people that have never known sin, they're going to say, tell us what it was like to be delivered. Tell us what it feels like to be redeemed from that curse. And so I ask one simple question. If you want to be on that glorious morning standing with the redeemed of the ages, would you want to stand with me tonight? I don't know if you heard that lyric. Abraham's seed as the sands of the sea. One day there'll be no more division, no more hatred, no more discontent, no more failures. We'll all be standing. And we'll take a breath for the first time in the perfection of the character of Christ. We'll see people that we haven't seen for a long time. We'll be shocked that they made it, and they'll be shocked that we made it. But by God's grace, there's no reason for anybody to be left out. So I want to pray tonight and just thank God for his saving grace, for his redemption, for his love, for his willingness to save a wretch like me. I don't deserve it. But his love is too deep to let me go. I know that. This free gift costs Jesus everything. But he says, I want to give it to you for free. Just take it. Just hold on to it. And he said, whoever the Father gives to me, no one can snatch him out of my hands. You need to leave here tonight knowing that if you're in Christ, your salvation is secure. No fear of tomorrow. I want to be able to go to bed at night, and if I don't wake up tomorrow, I'll see you in the glorious morning. Loving Father in heaven, the day is not too far distant because everything you said would happen in the closing hours of earth's history are happening with great rapidity around us. We are sinners saved by grace. We can't boast about anything. There's nothing that we can do to recommend us. There's no religious activity that can recommend us. Only the righteousness of Jesus. Only his shed blood can qualify us. And it's so good to know that there is a fountain that still flows tonight. And there's always room for one more at the cross. So, Father, may we leave here tonight, every age group, may we ask ourselves that simple question, why? What reason can I find that I don't want to be there? And may that column remain empty. There's no reason that I cannot make it by your blood. As we go from this place, Father, send your Holy Spirit so that we'll never be from your presence. May our hearts burn with the joy and the love to know that Christ did everything to save us, and that that free gift still flows and is available to every one of us. Thank you, precious Savior. Keep us, for we cannot keep ourselves. And hold us until that morning when sin has been forever removed. This is our prayer and our desire. And all of God's redeemed said, amen and amen. Now, we know that each night we've been at the record tables, but Max, I'm going to give you a chance. That's right. That's right. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Have a good night. When you leave, there will be an outline of the topic. But please, please, as you leave, listen carefully. As you leave, the papers that you filled in, please, there's a... Somebody's going to collect them as you leave. Please give those in. And we see you tomorrow morning for a powerful service. The message is entitled, Go Forward. God bless you. <laughs>